Shalom and fantastic day to everyone. I'm Joel, also known as Biscuit, and today is a lovely day. So it seems I've got 1000 subscribers. That's a special occasion, I guess. Isn't it? Thanks, everyone. I should probably make a special video to mark the occasion. But unfortunately, I'm a little bit win of productions right now, so I will do something different. Ask me anything. I will try to post an informative video answering your questions. But uh, because I, it, it takes a long, long time for me to make videos, I will concentrate on questions that might, might be interesting to have answers to and which make enter entertaining videos. And, uh, and questions which are a little bit too long to answer in a YouTube comment. So, to get this started with, I will do the first questions and answers right here. So, let's see. One question. Which languages do you speak? Alright, well I speak Finnish, it's my native language. For example, Ilmatyyn alukseni on täynnä ankeriaita. The Swedish education was mandatory in Finland. So, because of that I know some of it Swedish, but I, I don't really know it well. If I try an example, I could say, Ja heter Joel, men jaka inte talasus mykket svenska. But that's pretty much all I, can, all I can say in Swedish. If I read it, I can understand it a little bit more. Obviously, I know a little bit of English. My written English is a lot better than my spoken one, though. Because, well, it's a, it's a difficult language. American people often say to me that my accent sounds British. And uh, that may be because um, the vowels in the British pronunciation are a little more logical than the American ones. For example, in the English word dot, there's an O vowel in it, O dot, in how British people pronounce it. But when American people pronounce it, they say dot, dot. How does that even make sense? So I choose the most logical pronunciation, which is dot, like like the Briti like the British people do it. Then for words like no and only, I just choose to pronounce them that way because it sounds a little cool. Then I know some Japanese because I studied it for five years in a, in a school where where the pace was very slow. For example. Minasan hajimamaste kunen kurai nihongo benkyoshimasta. Nihon no kotoba o amari oboemasen suman. Pasakonde iroiro na tsuru kaaru no de jōzumie o suru koto ga dekimasu. Suki no anime wa hikaru no ko, Slayers, Read or Die, soshite tabun initial D. And finally, a little bit of Hebrew, mostly in the form of songs and dances. For example, Ine matovu manaim shevetachim kam yachad. So, based on all that experience, I can make an educated, educated guess. If I read something that is, for example, in Norwegian or Estonian. And finally, there's one question which demands an immediate and urgent answer. How in earth does the INS function in my simulator work? What's, what does the INS function do? Let's cover it. So, let's create a dummy CPU emulator, for example. A CPU has registers and it processes instructions. Instructions are identified by a number called opcode. For example, there might be other operations. 
some with two operands, some with three. Then some subtract operations as a counterpart. This all updates the flags. The flags tell whether the result of the calculation was zero, negative. A program running on the processor can use the flags to quickly decide on the next action. Now we might also have the same set of instructions, but without updating the flags. A useful computer will have more instructions than these eight, but just for the sake of example, these eight will do. Now we may notice a great amount of redundancy in these operations. Let's see what are the components that make up our instructions. Read A. Add B. Subtract B. Add C. Subtract C. Store to A. Update flags. All of our eight instructions can be synthesized from this list. All instructions begin with reading A. Some of them add B, others subtract B, some of them add C, some subtract C, all store to A, and the first four update flags. Do you see the relationship? We won't need the original switch case anymore. Now let's make a code for this opcode component map. I will begin by expressing them as a table. This table can be made into working C code by simply indexing the string constants. And now we might as well change the opcode from a function parameter into a template parameter. It is a compile time constant. Did you know you can index string constants like this? Let me demonstrate what exactly happened here. Let's make a string constant, like this. Now to read one character from the string, you use this bracket syntax. This is covered in beginner's C tutorials. But not many people realize that the string constant does not need to be stored in the variable. You can just use the string constant directly, like this, and discard the variable altogether. And the index number can also be a variable. There is nothing special about variables that never change. Now a keen eye might have noticed that my string constants here were actually binary numbers. A 1 for yes do this, and a 0 for no don't do that. You could also express them as hexadecimal numbers, like this. Now I just need to test the right bit from the hexadecimal number. The bitwise AND operation does that. This would be all that we need. But what if we don't have just 8 operations? What if we have 72? Then our table becomes 72 characters long. A 72-bit binary number. And our hexadecimal numbers would look like this. Let's make some analysis. In binary numbers, a single character represents two different options, one bit of data. By adding more characters, you convey more bits of data. Here's the actual mathematics. How about hexadecimal? We have 16 different options by character for bits of data. One character expresses much more data. You need fewer characters to express the same data. Can we do better? How many bits can we pack into a character of source code? If we use alphabetic characters, we have 26 options by character. When we add the lowercase and the numeric digits and two special characters, we get the power of 2, 64. 64 options by a single character. This is called base64. It packs 6 bits per character, where with hexadecimal we needed 18 characters to express 72 bits of data, with base64 we need only 12. A clear and significant reduction when you're making a large opcode table, like in Mane Simulator. Let's see how our opcode table becomes in C++ when we utilize base64. We need to translate our opcode tables into base64 constants. It is a bit laborsome to do, so I did the actual calculations off-screen. Now how do we use these string constants? The same way as before, indexing and bit ending. We need to calculate the index and bit mask. The index is the opcode number divided by 6. The bit mask comes from the remainder. However, this is not enough. We also need to decode the base64 expression. Let's make a simple inline function to do so. This is a constant expression function, a new feature in C11. 
This function is evaluated entirely at compile time. We will decode capital letters, lowercase letters, digits, and those two special characters. Now this was a bit of code repetition down here, so we will use a preprocessor macro to cut down the source code size. This makes the code so much neater, yet it still works exactly in the same way as it did in the beginning. Remember when I said that there's nothing special about variables that never change? We don't actually need those variables, let's poke them straight into the expression. Finally, because we only have 8 instructions after all, and not 72, let's delete the needless bits. This is what the code becomes. Tiny, isn't it? Yet it is very neat. This is in principle what I did in my simulator, only I did not stop at base 64. I actually created an application-specific scheme that encodes 8 bits per character, not 6. Decoding that scheme was considerably more complex than decoding base 64 is. You can also see here a version that uses hexadecimal numbers instead. Thanks for watching, see you next time.